I'm Lynn Smith, and welcome to the Bigfoot Project. October 1953, Casey County, Kentucky. A boy and his friend heard a thumping sound and moved closer to see what was making the sound. They walked around the rear of the friend's house to investigate the source. Upon rounding the corner of the house, they stopped and stared at a Bigfoot squatting down near the foundation of a neighbor's house about 30 feet away. They saw it from the side for 5 to 10 seconds as it was using two 18-inch long pieces of firewood to dig with. After a couple of blows, it raised up, turned, and started walking towards them, displaying its teeth at them in a kind of a snarl, but without making any sound. The boys, stricken with fear, ran back around and into the friend's house, where, after much effort, they got the friend's mother to take a look. When she did, however, the Bigfoot was gone, and the only evidence left was the disturbed ground where it had been digging. The animal must have moved with great speed to either a nearby creek or a nearby cornfield. The Bigfoot was approximately six and a half to seven feet tall and appeared to weigh over 300 pounds. It had very dark brown, coarse, stringy hair similar to a goat's. The hair on the chest, stomach area, and lower abdomen was a dull gray color. The face was black and the nose looked like a flattened human nose. The fingernails and toenails were very thick, possibly from an eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch thick and dirty. They looked as though they would have been useful for digging. It had two canine teeth that were a little larger than a human's. It had no sagittal crest, no noticeable breasts or sex organs, and no odor. This occurred about one and a half miles from the Green River, just at the edge of town, upon a small rise out of the river bottom. In 1977, my husband and I bought a small hobby farm in Taylor County, Kentucky, just outside the town of Campbellsville, about an hour drive from the Green River Lake. Our farm was surrounded by neighboring farms, but no one lived on the land bordering ours. The owners all lived in town, so our little farm was fairly isolated, and I liked it that way. In the summer of 1978, I believe the month was July, my husband, while alone at home, heard a sound one evening that frightened the daylights out of him, and he doesn't frighten easily. He called me at my friend's place, screaming at me, Where are the shotgun shells? His attitude, his franticness, scared me. I didn't know what was going on, and he wouldn't tell me. He just kept screaming, where are the shotgun shells? I finally told him, and he slammed the phone down. It wasn't until later that my husband related the story of what he had heard. He never did see anything, and years went by with no answers to that cry he had heard that evening. Although, for several years, he had watched nature films, which had various wildlife cries, I kept asking him, did it sound like that? To which he always replied, no, it was like nothing I've ever heard before. Now it's 1988, again in summer, and the month is August. It just started to turn dark in the evening when my husband came in from outside, and all he said was, Do you want to hear that sound? He didn't have to say any more. I knew right away what he was referring to, so we both went back outside and stood outside our kitchen window. I was standing there listening when I told him, I don't hear anything. He quickly replied, Shh, just wait. So I continued to listen. All of a sudden, this horrible cry came from our woods where our two creeks merged. It caused chills to run up and down my spine. My first reaction was shock. Then another cry was heard. This time, I felt myself slowly edging backwards towards the house. Whatever this thing was, the cry was like nothing I've ever heard from any wild animal before, and I remember starting to shake with fear. Then another cry was heard. This time it came from across the road in the woods where the creek continues to flow. This cry hadn't even crescendoed when there was another cry, heard from our side of the woods again. Oh my God, there are two of them, I thought. That was it. I turned and ran into the house. My husband came in with me, but he grabbed the shotgun and went back outside. He wanted me to hold the light for him as he investigated the woods, and I stated, You're out of your mind. I'm not going back out there. That basically was all that happened that night. My husband never saw anything, nor did I. But I did smell something. It was a very strong, musty odor that wasn't pleasant. Actually, the odor is like wafting across the gentle breeze. So sometimes it was very light, and sometimes much stronger. I remember wrinkling up my nose when it was strong and thinking, what on earth is that smell? So now, after ten years, I've heard the same sound that my husband had heard alone back in 1978. 
The next day, I did go down to where the two creeks meet and walked along the banks, looking for strange prints, but didn't see anything. Even though it was broad daylight and a gorgeous sunny day, just being down there gave me the creeps. What had happened the night before had really shook me up, and never again did I enjoy being down there anymore. Just the replay in my mind of those cries was enough to make me jumpy whenever I was close to the woods or creek again. The sound of those cries stuck in my mind, and I had a gnawing feeling that I had heard that sound before. But where? I was a video collector back then, still am, and quickly went through all my video collection to see if anything would jog my memory. I have many natural wildlife tapes, so I thought, maybe that's where I heard it. But when I came across a movie entitled Sasquatch, a feeling inside me told me to watch this tape, so I did. I sat in my living room and watched all the way through that movie until close to the end. They had the sound, the very same sound that my husband and I had just heard a few nights ago. As soon as I heard it, chills ran up and down my spine. I quickly rewound the tape to the beginning of where that sound was and left it there until my husband came home from work that evening. As soon as he came home, I told him I had something I wanted him to watch. So, within a few minutes, he was seated in the living room and I played the tape. As soon as that cry was heard on the tape, he jumped up yelling, That's it! That's the sound! We replayed that part of the tape over and over again, trying to allow all this information to sink in. We now felt we knew what we had heard. It was a Sasquatch, or actually two of them in the middle of Kentucky. An experience like this, you don't ever forget. You can't. It'll stay with us for the rest of our lives. My name is Alan. The Green River was dammed up to create an 8,210-acre lake called Green River Lake. During this time, my friend's family owned land on the Green River. Naturally, as the lake filled up, many caves in the area were flooded. We think that's what drove the Sasquatch in this story out into the open, searching for new territory. My friend and his cousin came down to the riverbank to do some target practice with their twenty-two rifles. They would walk upstream a ways, throw pop cans in the water, then run back downstream and wait for the pop cans to float by. While blowing the cans to smithereens, my friend's cousin's gun jammed. They walked around a tree line, across a field, and back up to their car, which was sitting on the side of the road. They opened the trunk, sat on the back bumper, and began to dislodge the shell from his twenty-two rifle. As they were reloading, they heard limbs snapping. They looked up and back toward the tree line they had just walked from. The tops of the trees were swaying wildly. My friend's cousin asked, Who let the elephant out? They decided to check it out. They closed the trunk and jogged back across the field, then walked quietly around the tree line and back into the opening on the river where they had been standing moments before. Sam, not his name, said when they came into the opening, something started screaming at them. They jumped and looked toward the scream. Standing on top of a deadfall was a creature covered in hair. His arms were above his head and he was waving them back and forth in a left-to-right motion. Sam's cousin spun the barrel of his rifle around and shot five times. Sam said all five shots hit the creature in his chest area. He said he could hear the bullets landing almost like the sound of them hitting the water. The creature dropped his arms and fell straight back behind the deadfall. He hit with a large thud, then silence. They were both in shock, so holding on to each other, they walked slowly over the deadfall and looked over it to the back side. The creature was laying on his back and not moving. One of them, not sure which one, said, What the heck is it? This stirred the creature. He opened his eyes and jumped up. They jumped back and turned and started running. The creature galloped away in one direction, the two cousins in the opposite. I say galloped because of the way he was swinging his arms. Friday, August 9, 2019, myself, Jeff, and three friends, all last minute, decided to take a trip into the night to do some Bigfoot searching. We all love the outdoors and are interested in cryptids. We all met up at my place and set off from Federal Way, Washington, at around 7 p.m. We had a clear and specific place in mind where we were headed. It's a place where I've camped at for over a week before, and not far from where one of us had an encounter a few years ago. It was a dark and weird night, and I say that because there was only overcast and a storm rolling in, causing it to be pitch-black darkness. No moonlight, no starlight, nothing. 
We were in very close proximity to Mount Rainier National Park, off of Skate Creek Road, and onto Forest Service Road number 52, and then onto number 84, in the High Rock Lookout area. We parked the van in a very specific spot I was very familiar with, because I had camped this exact spot for just over a week just a couple of years ago. By this point, the sky is flashing from the lightning storm in the distance, followed by no sound of thunder. It was way off from us still at this point. However, the sky and cloud cover was acting as a projector of sorts, and that these flashes were having a strobing effect. It was a quick flash to where you could see around only for a split second. Very creepy and mood-setting, but we didn't care, and we were just excited to get away from work for the weekend, even though it was an out-and-back type of thing. We got our gear on, our firearms, jackets, and headlamps, etc. After we were finished gearing up, at this point we shut the van off and all light sources and really took in just how quiet and dark, and I mean eerily quiet and the darkest dark you could think of, the type of darkness where you can't see your hand in front of you. The only light now was the lightning. We then turned the key to the aux setting and dialed the car stereo to the maximum setting and proceeded to play some vocalizations. It was a short audio clip that we played at least four to six times and waited in silence. And nothing. We then left the van and headed off on foot down the service road. My buddies were a little nervous, which was understandable. The atmosphere was a little unsettling. However, I was not at all nervous or anything because this place was familiar to me, as I had essentially lived here for a week a couple of years ago. I know where the road leads to, and as you reach the end, you'll know as it dead ends. I'm now in front with the headlamp, my buddies are behind me and not being the quietest of people, and that's when they stop and say, there's something to the right, as though something was following us and was walking when we walked. I told them that they're crazy and they aren't hearing anything, and we laugh it off and proceed down the road. Pretty uneventful, really. We reach the end of the road, which opens to a clearing, and clearly a spot people have shot at in the past. By this point, the storm is over the top of us, and the rain is coming down, and the timing of lightning to thunderclap is only a couple of seconds. We decide we better head back to the van. Minus the weather, and the thing pacing us, nothing eventful at all really happened. We got back to the van, threw our gear in, changed our upper layers because at this point we were soaked. We get in and start off to explore deeper into the forest and find another spot to park and search. The weather wasn't really agreeing with us on that, and it was getting late. Next thing you know, we zigged when we should have zagged and ended up on a very primitive road. Ended up turned around and lost for a while until our driver found his way out and back onto the main Skate Creek Road. But let's go back a little for a second. Me and another friend are in the back seats, and the driver and co-pilot have windows down because we're all smokers, so the heat is blasting. My friend sitting behind me asked them to shut the windows in the back because we were still wet and it was chilly back there. So to be clear, we're in a van with sliding doors on both sides, and the only windows in the back that open, only open maybe an inch outwards for venting. He tells us that they are closed, and my buddy is now getting pissed because clearly there's a breeze, and it clearly sounded like they were open. Finally, we just dropped the window thing and proceeded onwards. Sorry, I only bring up the windows and all that because of what happens next. As I said before, besides the weather and us getting lost, etc., nothing eventful at all really happened. That's until we got back to my house. It was there that we discovered the cause of that breeze and the reason for the whole window argument. One of the van's back windows had been broken. We only really discovered this as we were getting our gear out of the van and noticed there was glass. Glass? What the F happened? That window didn't break while we were anywhere near, on, in, or around the van. This is a window that only opens outward on one side, and the other sits in a metal housing track from top to bottom, and the bottom of this track is bent outwards. Our initial thoughts were, did something throw something at the window as we were on that walk? Did someone smash it and steal something? We looked, and nothing was missing. No bags, no weapons, no ammo, nothing. After some thinking, we realized that whomever or whatever had broken that window would have had to have grabbed the bottom corner and pulled it outward and popped it. That would explain why that metal housing was bent. What we noticed next was there was glass on top of the van. We were all in disbelief of this, asking ourselves what the F could have happened here, when, where, what. It's now 3 a.m., we're discovering this, and we're all tired and wanting to get home, but yet still talk about what could have happened. Once we grabbed our stuff and shut the hatch, that's when I noticed it. 
We only noticed it because of how dirty that back window was, and the light in my house down the driveway was illuminating it. What we discovered was a handprint with clear fingerprints in the thumb, index finger, and palm on the glass. The print is huge, from base to palm to ridge just below the fingers, was as big as my hand. In that, and around that print, we were able to recover a couple of hair samples. What the F happened last night? Did those vocalizations send out a distress call that was answered and investigated as though one of their own was injured or trapped in that van? I don't know. These are the photos the witness took of the handprint on the window and the damage done to their vehicle. Thanks for joining me on the Bigfoot Project. I think you might find this video of interest as well. If you have a story you would like to share here, you can email me, Lynn Smith, at thebigfootproject at mail.com.